<laughs> Is there any public comment? There's nobody online. And you couldn't park, right? You couldn't park. Yeah. <laughs> Got here in plenty of time. Why do all those Zoom meetings happen on the same day? Um, uh, has everyone had a chance to review the September 4th meeting minutes? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions or comments on them? No. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I'll second. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mm -hmm. uh, carried. Um, the analysis on infill housing, a, a lot of nice chart oh a nice lot of nice charts and pictures and that I didn't understand. Okay. Well good. Then I'll okay. try to explain it. So <laughs> Melanie Needle was supposed to come to the meeting, but um well, I overlooked that it's uh the first night of Rosh Hashanah. So oh, wow. mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, uh at services right now, completely. Anyway, uh, I will attempt, uh, we met this morning, and I will attempt to um, summarize the work that she did, uh, and starting with the uh, memo. All right, make this a little bit bigger, maybe, or not. Um, so uh, this project is part of the CCRPC Housing Navigator program, and they uh, did some work for us and, and for Shelburne and, I don't know, maybe another town. But anyway, mainly the work um, that they did was to do uh, or are doing still in progress. Um, they conducted a GIS analysis um, to identify parcels with um, infill potential in Williston. Um, and um, so there's there's basically, we had done a build-out analysis um, a few years back. And um, so we had some idea of each parcel's development potential um, based on resource constraints. And then I updated um, the development potential early this year based on the, the new requirements of the Act for 47, 147, 47. Or something. <laughs> um, the Homes, um, the Homes Act, um, which allows five dwelling units per acre on areas served by water and sewer. So, um, Anyway, so using that updated um, file, um, Melanie made some maps and kind of did some looking around. Um, and so the map one, which I'm going to show you, um, shows kind of overall development potential in the in the north in the sewer service area. There are some, you know, the, the areas in dark blue symbolize the, the parcels of development potential, but ignore the ones that are outside this blue line, which represents the sewer service area. I mean, you know, ignore them for now because, you know, it doesn't. We're not trying to not, push development where there's no. Exactly. Yeah. So, absolutely, um, yeah. so, and then this orange line that you see here. Um, it represents areas that are within a half mile of uh, transit. So that's another, you know, kind oh, okay. of thing to um, to focus or reason to focus growth is where there's, you know, where there's good transit and uh, within areas that have water and sewer. So the growth center ha is sort of blanked out because, you know, we're, we, we know that that has a lot of development potential and that's not really... I think where this committee will, should focus attention is is on the growth center because um, the the town is doing some other stuff to try to get development in there and it's it's a little bit more uh, I don't know complex I guess um, 
whereas we're talking infill development on already existing roads and streets um, and infrastructure that's already kind of there. So looking around, you know, um, the, the parcels that are sort of white here uh, have very limited um, development potential. They can support one additional unit. Um, so, you know, Melanie, that, that's sort of, that's, that's one area to focus on. I think you guys have been discussing, you know, how to, how to encourage folks to um, develop ADUs and duplexes. So that's sort of one, you know, one type of infill potential. Um, and then another type is like looking at those parcels that have a little bit more uh, development potential. And um, those, um, you can't really see the legend, but the development potential is, is, is kind of symbolized along the gradient from that white to dark blue, uh, with the dark blue having greater potential. And so she kind of zoomed around and she noticed a few areas that, that are sort of ripe for development. And, and one of those is um, this area, South Brownell and Williston Road has a lot of um, development potential, infill potential. Um, and then of course there's the village, um, which also has a lot of potential. There are some very large lots there. Um, and there, and then there's also up along Essex Road, there's um, several parcels along the east side of, of Essex Road with um, good development potential. Although I say with a caveat, because um, one of those parcels uh, came in for a pre-application. It was uh, a pretty big parcel. I wanna say it was like 20-ish acres. And they found that, you know, after they did the wetland delineation that like nearly the whole part was wet. So mm -hmm. it didn't have nearly the potential that they thought. Mm -hmm. And and that's probably going to be the case with a lot of these larger undeveloped parcels that they're going to be very wet. Um, but anyway, so that being said, um, Melanie uh, made a, a map kind of zooming in on the South Brownell area um and i'll show you that next um let's see um i'll show you the one the with that's um numbered by how many additional units it could potentially the parcels could potentially support um i'm gonna zoom out a little bit mm -hmm. um so there's, um, now this one down here belongs to the Ignite Church. So I, I kind of doubt that, you know, they're gonna develop housing there, but maybe you never know. Um, Which church? Ignite, Ignite. Um, yeah, used to be married there. Marathon. Right. Um, I think where the, the ones that are interesting are these along the north side of Williston Road, um, there's a lot of potential there, um, some big lots. Um, and the, also down here, these two parcels, um, one, it's, I guess, together, they're owned by the same landowner, and together they could support um, potentially 15 additional units. They're currently vacant, um, and they're owned by O'Brien, um, and just, um, you know, I, I was asking Matt, you know, hey, what's going on with these parcels down here? And he said that in 2013, the O'Brien um, uh, company came in for a pre-application for uh, eight units of housing on those two parcels. And um, they decided ultimately, I guess the, the um, I don't know, the board or whatever, decided against building any housing there because um, that site is near the, the Commerce Street um, Plume area, which is a super fun site. And there's, you know, I guess I guess there's um, a possibility that there's some con con contamination issues to deal with there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily rule it out because there's brownfields funding 
um, through CCRPC, and there's there's kind of ways of, of dealing with that. But anyway, that um, I think that was particularly interesting. I was on the select board then. Oh, I okay. remember that. You, you we, yeah, we yeah. were not. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we were just very worried. That, yeah, especially about building housing. <laughs> right, you know, otherwise it's right contaminated. But um, <clears throat> you know, there there's uh, <clears throat> there are properties that have brownfields issues that get redeveloped and it, they go through a process that's um you know they they do an assessment and they figure out um, what remediation is needed and it's usually very thorough and um comprehensive mm -hmm. so again you know i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily i mean you know and ultimately it's the it's the property owner's decision what they want to do but um it might be worth um doing some outreach yeah i think 11 years later there's more there's more available to yeah to mitigate so yeah yeah for sure um mm -hmm. the owner of lots one right above uh, uh whatever road it is at shunpike road you mean um, immediately on this corner yes those yeah. two yeah those two lots the owner of one or both of those lots tried to give them to habitat for humanity to build a house oh really and uh the uh, uh is it ireland that 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 has the industrial lot next to it uh, has uh, said that it can't be buildable because it's their trucks create too much danger for the lots. Really? Interesting. Those two there? The, are these two? This one? I think it, 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 mu it must be that one. Yeah, it must be that one. Uh, mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Oh, it's kind of commercial there. And then this is... Um, yeah, what is this? That's um not sure what that is. It's a it's somebody who's got construction vehicles that they huh. oh, that old they truck out in the front. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 And that's super exciting. Yeah. I mean, all those, but those all those the ones and twos. That other road. Well, the it was really, you know, the homeowner or the owner of the land was feeling like he did he had done nothing, and all of a sudden his land didn't have any value because of a company coming in next to him. But all those ones and twos on the other side of that's Williston on the northern um, half of this picture. Yeah, yeah. This that, is. I mean, like... that, that's a great neighborhood feel. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Is this like the rest? That's, that's uh, well, what is it? Yeah. Uh, that is Aspen Lane, White Birch. Yeah, Lamp yeah. Light. Okay. Lamp Light, yeah. yeah. No, okay. Yeah. That is really cool work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'll definitely share that mm -hmm. with Melanie. And so she is going to make a, a map for the other two maps for other two area, the other two areas. Mm -hmm. She ran out of time um, this time around. I mean, I kind of asked her if she could pers prepare something for this meeting, like on short notice, and she was nice enough to to do it. Um, but she wasn't able to totally complete everything. Um, so we can look at those. Um, but I mean, so knowing that, you know, there is this type of uh, infill potential, what do you think is, what do you think is the, the best approach or the, you know, the next step, if you want to take any steps or. But that, I mean, is that something you could go back to O'Brien and say. You, you know, could, you could. This could, this could fly now. You, I mean, you, you could, you could. You could say, and and I guess that's that would be you know trying to figure out what language you want to you know what you want to put in a letter that will you know potentially you know kind of hook somebody, but you know like yes, there's a dire housing crisis. There's an opportunity to um, you know to create badly needed housing. Um, there are um, you can. You know, you can get assistance with brownfield issue with brownfield on brownfield sites, um, particularly if you're building affordable housing. I think I think that's the case. Um, Especially since he's already a developer. 
and the other ones probably yeah. aren't owned by developers. So then, you know, right. I mean, I given how many people showed up for the Shelburne meeting, I think we might want to talk about having our own meeting. Um, and I think there's both like the ADU path, like, I mean, if you had a, the ADU, ADU rules are even looser, you know, less land, require less land, but there's also the subdividable path, right? Right. So, um, I mean, the one thing, you know, when I, I, I did mention to Melanie that about the workshop and how, and, and actually, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that was also on the agenda somewhere um, to kind of, uh, you know, recap that, but, um, how much interest there was and, and, you know, I mean, she made it, her point was like ADUs are so expensive <laughs> that <laughs> she's not sure that that's like a real viable path to, to achieving like a lot of, you know, like right. achieving housing and volume. Um, I mean, it could be great for individuals who, who want to do that and can be successful or, you know, or to, you know, it could be great for the individual homeowners. Um, well, I mean, I think all housing is expensive, so there's no, mm -hmm. there's no friendly solution here. Um, you know, on, on these kinds of things, like, you know, it's interesting, a, a young woman I know wants to build an ADU on her mother's lot, but um, but, but she was saying that she wanted her mother to get the loan for, to put the ADU on it, but her mother wants to make her house more accessible. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, how big is it? Turns out it's an acre. It's not in our town. But, you know, I'm like, well, if it's an acre, it's probably subdividable. So, you know, I think it gets people mm -hmm. and then they could both have their own mortgages or one gets a housing improvement loan and one gets a loan to build an ADU. Right. But, but um. I mean, so, I think these conversations are worth having with yeah. the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, for for properties where I mean, it's pretty clear that it's it's a homeowner's property, and yeah, they might have more room on their land to develop more. Do you think it's worth reaching out to those folks, or would you want to just kind of reach out to? you know, either developers with vacant parcels or developers whose parcel has some, re, you know, it's clear that there's re, some redevelopment potential there or, or I don't know. Maybe we could do both. Like, yeah, if we were going to do a thing about ADUs, the one in Shel Shelburne was also about duplexes. Right. If, if we said ADUs and multiple... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lot subdivision or something like that or that might be you know we could say we have maps if you'd like to see whether you can subdivide yeah mm -hmm. well yeah I mean I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we can send out a kind of general uh, letter saying your, your property has been identified by you know by, yeah. um, by mapping in the, from the CCRPC the, the yeah. potential for something here and you know, and it ties them into finding out more. Could we start, or would it be a good idea to start by by publicizing what the requirements are, so that people have some sense of of of, of what Identify the law allows? I know I kind of feel before, like before I don't we want to begin before we order. try to to encourage people to do it. Let them know. Let the whole community know yeah. mm -hmm. uh, know what is involved and what you have to do to. Uh, to to make this happen, what the law allows and encourages. Yeah, well, we've looked at the Addison County. Um, they write a, wrote up a nice hand book on oh, is ADUs, right? Yeah, and I mean, and to change it for Williston is not a huge deal. There's, I mean, Melinda would have to do like the, the actual what are your town rules on that, but. Like, I, I, I'm thinking like getting the observer to put in a, yeah. a feature story mm. that, that 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 talks about what's allowed and how to go about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then have a community thing that would be here's you know like under, the one we had this thing about ADUs, yeah. kind of this thing about yeah. subdivision, and then perhaps targeted letters as we get a little bit further mm -hmm. along. Yeah, yeah, I feel a little nervous about targeting. People. So. I I guess like for the article, um, 
I think we would need some guidance on like like what rules are, are you going to try to summarize? I mean, because yeah, there's, there's, the, there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah, exactly. They're different. We're, depending yeah. on where you yeah. live, they're mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Well, you so, just want people to read it and think they want to read more. So maybe having that <laughs> handbook ready to go for someone has the next round of questions. Mm -hmm. But it is more than like three questions that you have to answer before you, mm -hmm. you're ready. Well, and there's not only the town, there's, there's all the state stuff. So, mm -hmm. that, I mean, you know, we need to say something about some of some of that, and and there's yeah. the like there's the VHIP money that's available, and which mm -hmm. actually makes it sound a little better. But yeah, I mean, yes, when I started getting yeah. into it, I mean, there's just a you know I've still got a, I haven't filed refiled like I have a stack of stuff on my you know, one of my desks. So. I, I mean, to me, I'm not sure that this is something that can be summarized in an article. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. think that it's it's very it's very complex, and it just you know, it kind of depends. If you're talking about AEUs, that's one thing. If you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, subdividing a three-acre parcel, that's entirely different. Um, right. I mean, we could, you know, we could have like once a month. We, you know, we can ask the observer. Can can the housing committee write a, you know, write a short thing and say this? The here here's an idea that we're working on. You know, and each mm -hmm. month have spotlight you know, different ideas to reassure people for one thing that we're actually, you know, doing something. Right, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and then, and then really, but, but do make them short things that sort of touch the surface and kind of pique people's interests and then tell them where they can get more information. Um, yeah. Um, the energy committee does that. Uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, they write monthly articles for the observer yeah. the green section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a matter, I mean, they've been incredibly consistent like they've pretty much done every single month um they maybe have missed a, a few um but it's the months go by fast and it's oh. like you know what do you know okay um every two who's months gonna write, you're right who's gonna write the article that's due next week yeah <laughs> so um you know it's i think it's i think it's a really good way to um to do outreach to folks mm -hmm. um but it does take. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, that that's a good idea. But I think that 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 those things on page six don't uh, get uh, as much attention as getting the cover story. So if we could have an, an introductory cover story that says there's a housing crisis and and here are some possibilities for for how individuals that live in our town can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. uh, might be a good way to start. But I'm not skillful enough to write that article, so I, I, I hesitate to bring it up, but I'm sure there are people who do have writing skills that, that could do it. But I, but I think, I don't know how many column inches you get for that, that mm -hmm. page one story, but... Did uh, you all, I think there was a cover story pretty recently in The Observer about how um, the affordable housing thing about housing yeah. some yeah. some really great pull quotes, <laughs> um, but anyway, mm -hmm. I say that sort of sarcastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I think that the observer is paying attention to what you guys are doing, and mm -hmm. and I think they uh, they also appreciate articles too. Yeah. 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 Well, um, you know, probably I know that I mean the publisher is in yeah. Rotary, so she's mm -hmm. she's been really great about um yeah making sure that things in the community actually get covered unlike the previous owners <laughs> but anyway if you're ever interested in getting involved in rotary you'd be more than welcome uh, totally yeah. never misses that opportunity yeah. okay. <laughs> you never miss that opportunity to invite people to rotary. <laughs> um okay well yeah. So she's That's gonna work on a breakdown of other neighborhoods. What's that? So she's gonna work no. on a break this she's, kind of analysis. There's three other areas that she's gonna um produce maps for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you just go back to map one and tell me what each of the different colors means? You told me yeah. that the, you told us that the yellow line was was within a half a uh, a quarter of a mile of public transportation, and that somewhere in there there's a blue line that's the mm -hmm. That's the boundary the of, of sewer the, service uh, area so. of the sewer system. Yeah. Well, if I look at the extreme right hand side, there's 
uh, the railroad going through and yeah. and, uh, and it's blue. What does that blue mean? So um, the blue means that there's, let's see, let me, let me go down here. Developable. Um, that that, any parcel that's covered, that's colored dark blue could in theory support over 11 dwelling units, 11 to anywhere from 11 to 100. Um, but we want blue and inside the right. So so that the sewer, sewer, the sewer line. So that's we want anything that's outside of the sewer. Yeah. Line. So, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, just in terms be, of cost, it should be there, but it is. But just ignore it. <laughs> okay. Um. You know. So really, what you know, you should probably focus on is just anything inside this area and up there. Um, yep. So the the lighter the darker the blue the more development potential it has. Oh, so there's one spot there that's uh, um, I don't know where it is in the world. Uh, and it's on course, the, it's on the south side of Mountain View. Um, well, there's quite a bit on the south side of. Well, Mountain and View. and keep in mind that that this parcel and this parcel have already gotten development approvals. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I mean, this parcel is still undergoing development approval, but uh, this parcel is is undeveloped and uh, they they have talked about developing, but done nothing more yeah. than that. Kind of like, this I, parcel probably shouldn't be, no, it shouldn't, because most of it is developed. There's one little part up here where the um, the owner old developer, barn. what's that? Where the old barn is? No, well, yeah. near it, but this is Caroline Court. Yeah. It's a new development. There's one parcel up here that was supposed to be developed as a daycare. And I think the developer um, owner is going to um, build houses on it. I think he's he's going to try to build like seven or eight houses oh, okay. there. Um, but yeah, so, so you know, um, and then there's uh, Trinity Baptist Church parcel. They they were sort of they they underwent some development approval um, and ended up kind of dropping the project because it, it was just turning out to be too expensive. Um, but they were going to build a whole bunch of houses back there. Six or eight, if I remember right. Uh, more than that. More than that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it was more along the lines of like I want to say. Between twenty and thirty homes, but yeah. Anyway, and where's the new parkland that's alongside the river? That is up here. That's right that here. section right there. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And and you have two sections that have sewer that are south of the interstate. The one on the left is is um, Hurricane Lane, uh, the police station and the parking area, and that. Uh, is that Hurricane Lane mm -hmm. uh, business area? Right. What's the one that's further over? I South thought that Ridge. was just Thomas Chittenden Health Center. No, I, South South Ridge isn't. Was added because their their sewer system failed. So you um, mean Meadow Ridge? Ridge? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I mean. Meadow, Sorry, yeah. Meadow Ridge. Excuse but the, those area, yeah, I mean, and there is the Thomas Chittenden Health Center area. That's um, but the the places that were added because their sewer system is failing they don't really count as being part of the sewer service area because we're not going to connect anything new mm -hmm. um, within those areas porter was another example sure. um, they have their private water system and then the town sources yeah. the pressurized line right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. thank you yeah so well, was there did we think we would try to do a else? letter to developers Anything else on this? Do we, we do we did we end up with a plan or did we just talk about it? Well, I could work with you on updating that um, Addison County well manual, right? Because because um, if we get people excited, we do have to have the next layer of information ready to go. So how we how do we get there? Well, so I I actually um, Pam suggested that we um, see if the Chittenden Regional Planning Commission will do it as as part of their UPWP program, and I, and I would recommend that too mm -hmm. because honestly I don't know if I have the capacity to like <laughs> take that on and and I mm -hmm. think it should be a countywide thing, um, 
And so, yeah, so, so I think I already, I actually did ask Melanie, she's just to put it in the back of her mind. So um, I think she's going to talk to her folks there about whether that could be done. And um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, and then, and the other thing is that um, I reached out to the, the um, a, a, uh, Addison County Regional Planning Commission director to get the files. He hasn't, he's, I yeah, haven't been able to reach him. Like, he's just, I don't have money. So <laughs> it, may, it may take, you know, it may take a little while. So maybe this is something we track, but we get, if we get our reference material ready to go, then we can decide yeah. how we point people towards it, mm -hmm. whether it's a meeting mm -hmm. or letters. Yeah. I mean, I could see, uh, up and I would see I could see creating that guide for Chittenden County and then even like workshopping and doing a workshop to show people how to use it because it's got so many good tools in there. Like it's got links to these um worksheets, spreadsheets that you can use to kind of figure out whether you know how to how to um price your rental to make it work financially or how much things are going to cost. And so it's really it's there's a lot to it. And I think it'd be really valuable, but yeah, we'll see. Well, then once we get that up to speed, I'm I'm willing to like talk to Susan and, and maybe write, you know, to help, help write something. Or... That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Did, Anything else? Well, did we want to talk to try to reach out to developers that have parcels or not? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah. How would we do that? I mean, you, I guess you could start with this small South Brownell area if you wanted to and just just reach out to those. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe later on revisit the other areas to see if there's there's um, folks, you know, within those other targeted areas that you reach out to. But, yeah, I don't think it would hurt to, to just if you just want to put some feelers out to, um, you know, to to some folks in the South Brown area, um, you know, and how even do, if it is just O'Brien. Yeah, how do you know who that, who's developer owned and who's just... Uh, well, you can sort of, you can sort of guess <laughs> a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. I kind of, like, I kind of know I, <laughs> who some of them are. Um, and I also know, you know, uh, yeah. So it's, it's partly guessing game, partly like, you know, word of mouth. Um, you know, I can I can ask like folks in here, hey, do you know who, you know, what about the owner of this parcel? Do you know anything about them? Yeah. You know, kind of thing. So, so yeah, trial and error, sort of. Yeah. Or even, you know, and you could even reach out to just people who are property owners who live on the property if their parcel, you know, looks if it if it looks big enough so that it could you know be subdividable or support uh, a large number of units, you know, you could always reach out to them too. And, um, Especially within the area surrounded by the yellow lines and the blue lines. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. It's sad that the yellow line doesn't extend to the village anymore. I know. It is. It is sad. Does the latest proposal on cutbacks on public transit reduce that anymore? Um, well, I mean, definitely the village line is never, it's probably not going to come back in yeah. any time in the near future. Um, and there may be other reductions. There probably will be other reductions in service. Um, but we don't yet know what those, you know, we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't know. Okay. So who would compose the letter <laughs> to the to the South Brownell uh, landowners? That... Well, and I mean, I think if you're going to send it to just people, then they need to have a reference thing. You can say it, you know, if you want to know more, here's right. what you read. If you're going to talk to developers, I mean, they can sort it out on their own. So are you proposing we have a developer letter right now, or do you provide? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think a developer letter. Just to O'Brien. Sure, O'Brien's for those lots. Yeah. yeah. 
Let her invite them to come and talk to us and and to explain what their problems of development are and then mm -hmm. yeah. encourage them to um yeah I can I can reach out to uh you said the Evan Lang spelled or whatever. I mean yeah. they're they're like buried right now in the big giant O'Brien development in South Burlington, but um mm -hmm. I don't know, could reach out. Okay. And I guess John is not able to work at all. He's paralyzed. John O'Brien. Mm -hmm. That sounds terrible. Well, so with the, those two actions, I think maybe we should move on to the next item on our agenda, unless there's any objection. The clean heat standard, cost implications and engagement with developers. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So we, I've read the information that's on the website. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, so as you know, um, you know, the Energy Committee has been, they discussed uh, at their last meeting kind of general framework for a clean heat standard. Um, and uh, you all want information from developers. You want to hear from developers about and, and want more information about the costs of that. Um, so I did come across this uh, this piece of uh, this uh, report um, that was done for the city of Burlington when they were, you know, before they adopted their clean heat ordinance and sort of comparing the costs of um, developing with a conventional heating system and. Uh, an all electric, um, well, not only heating system, all electric home. And so, you know, they made some assumptions about electricity rates and uh, about uh, gas rates. The gas rates are now, their assumptions are low, um, lower than what it costs now. I think it's around 120 something per. Mm -hmm. um, and they looked at various types of construction um, and, and different types of equipment. Uh, but kind of like the getting down to sort of the, the, uh, the bottom, the take home here. Um, so you look at, you know, the baseline scenario is basically just your conventional heating system using natural gas. This is the, the installation costs. And then you look at um, air, water, heat pump. Um, and what's that WL heat pump? I, don't know what that is. I was interested in how little difference there was between the air water heat pump and the ground source heat pump in multifamily houses. Yeah, I I don't I'm a little suspicious. It could that. be because the, the excavation work that's already gone on doesn't require Maybe. extensive yeah. additional excavation. Right. Um and then um the I I was interested that to see that air source heat pump plus electric resistance heat the installation costs are lower than than the uh, conventional, but if you just are installing twenty six eighteen versus twenty six ninety six per yeah. square foot, so that the the electric resistance is really is really higher. The graph doesn't show it well, but the total at the top does twenty uh, twenty six ninety six per square feet twenty six ninety six twenty six eighteen for the heat pump. No, entirely. that's that's the air to water heat pump. Yes, but it's less than the air air um, air source heat pump, and it's less than the conventional heating system. I must not be reading it right. So the conventional heating system is twenty eight thirty nine per square foot, and yep. the the air source heat pump plus electric resistance is twenty six ninety six. And they have the line all the way across. So if you're below the Right, the line, so then you're cheaper. Than, than yes. The costs are less. If you're above it, they're higher. So, but using the heat pump water heaters reduces it even more. Right. Mm. Um, and then, 
so those are installation those are installation costs uh, then you look at energy use um, and the, uh, you know the energy use is much less um, in all those electric scenarios than for a um, gas uh, baseboard heat and split air conditioning. Um, and then- So what are the colors in that chart, that, that the one on usage? That wasn't clear to me when I looked at, oh, okay. Yeah, heating, so the legend, you know, this is gas. gas heating, domestic hot water, gas, mm -hmm. cooling electricity. And then for the for this, this is domestic hot water electricity, okay. pumping electricity. Or, or not, or, I'm sorry. It's Cooling interesting to see how, how much more efficient the ground source heat pump is than, uh, yeah. than the air, air water heat pump. Yeah, it definitely is for sure because it's all underground yeah. and, mm -hmm. and where the temperature is stable, pretty stable year round. Um, then for, um, for the costs of heating. So this is a multifamily new construction. Now, this first bar here is is existing homes. So it's like, you know, probably minimally insulated homes. And it's um, costing the highest to heat and cool. That seems to make sense. And then um, this is kind of your baseline, new construction with gas, baseboards, and a split AC system. So it is the cheapest way um, to heat and cool. And then um, then you have your your electric, all electric systems where you um, the air, water, heat pump, which was the cheapest to install, is actually the most expensive to use. Um, and then the rest of them are about on par with the ground source heat pump being more efficient and, and more and cheaper to run. Um, but these, the heat pumps and heat pump plus electric resistance are less than heating your typical existing home today, but more than your um, new construction with gas heat. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the way it is there. Um, and then the biggest potential improvement is in the old hundred year old houses. That, right. That mm -hmm. right. Like sure. so now this is all multifamily, right? Yeah. That can make sense because Burlington is right. A lot of multifamily. Um and then okay, so this is multifamily new construction if the tenants um have their own meters. Uh I guess for gas um, includes fixed charges for tenants. So yeah, again, here's your existing home. It's costing a lot to heat and cool. And then um, new construction actually is pretty, you know, with a gas system is actually pretty much more on Whoops, it's it's much more on par with these. It's um, it's some of these electric um, systems are going to be less expensive. But why does that? Maybe that's less expensive for the building owner, <laughs> not the tenant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, because that wouldn't make sense. Um, yeah. Right. Um, 
Tenant it says tenants moving from a typical mixed fuel existing building into a new all electric building may see their energy costs go down. Um, are they not? Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah. That was a little, this part is a little confusing to me. Yeah, the that, that comment that they're roughly break even doesn't make sense. Um, now, when you look at life cycle costs, um, so this is this is important because in these life cycle costs they incorporate um, a carbon fee, and I think that's what kind of makes all this on par. Um, so this is like your typical um, gas system is this dash line, mm -hmm. and then it's showing you. Uh, avoided costs on on the lower end, and then increased costs on the upper end. So, oh, I see. Okay. See. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the net. Um, so this is uh, a dollar square foot cheaper life cycle costs. Um, that's a air water air water heat pump. And then air source heat pump only is a is a buck is almost two dollars a square foot more expensive, and then then these are uh, less expensive than than your gas. Uh, yeah, air air source heat pump plus electric resistance, and then the ground source had uh, the least um, the most avoided costs and the least increased costs over the life cycle of the equipment. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting, mm -hmm. um, but again, um, that's with the the carbon fee, which is this um, blue uh, mm -hmm. one eighty four square foot. So, and and so it's sort of it's a policy question, you know, and whether to consider that carbon fee, like pretty much for everything, mm -hmm. you know, and there, yeah, so, and up to now, obviously we haven't been, um, but that would be, that would be something new. Um, and then, yeah, okay, so this is again the tenant meter which yeah, is that just crazy. doesn't match the the early chart that uh, that showed the costs compared to convention costs. Mm. This is a fifteen year life cycle, rather than uh, than the initial construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so I mean. Mm. Can you go back up to the initial construction? Because I guess yeah. as a housing yeah. committee, we're, yeah. we're more about, can we get things over the line, right? Mm -hmm. So this, uh, that's just energy yeah. use, installation cost. So this mm -hmm. is the installation cost. Um, and then you go back down to that other chart and Which well, one? The 15-year life, the last one that we were just looking at. That one. Oh, no, there, I think the next one doesn't have that potential policy on it. Go to the next chart after this one. Oh, I, I think it, it does. Yeah, it does. Okay. It's, just a, it's a tenant near oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> and I think that this is from the perspective of a building owner, not the tenant, mm -hmm. is my takeaway on this. Yeah. Any other? Oops. 
And then the next part of the charts were uh, business, and that didn't have the same advantage to uh, yeah. this system. Mm. So what is it that, that the Energy Committee wants to do with this? Well, with this, they haven't seen it yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. But they want to require heat pumps, right, in all future building, right? Yeah, so, well, it's it's not, yeah, so the Energy Committee is recommending that the, um, the town require uh, carbon-free sources of heating for for the primary heating system and domestic hot water, so that that are capable of supporting up, like up to eighty five percent of the heating and cooling needs. So that's what they're recommending. And then the other fifteen percent can be um, natural gas or wood or whatever. Um, so when they talk about it being the primary. Are they Assuming everybody's going to have two systems, um, I mean, why would you? Not necessarily, with... but just to give the flexibility in case, like, if somebody wants to do a hybrid system. So what's what? Uh, my understanding is that that unless you get the very very high quality heat pump system, that that it, they're not terribly effective uh, below uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit. So that so that. Everybody essentially, unless they have the, the, even if they have a system that'll go down to minus ten, in northern Vermont, you still need a supplemental system. So, what are they suggesting that people should get? Uh, um, Some people have the um, electric resistance heat as the backup, and that only runs at very extremely low temperatures. Mm -hmm. Some on, on the energy committee has um, had a heat bump for the last five years, and he says. His house has been warm down to 25 degrees below zero with that, with the heat pump. I mean, I think, anyway, um, but, but yeah, you are, you know, some developers are going to want to put that hybrid system in for, you know, sort of guarantee that there's always going to be enough heat, um, even in O'Brien. They well, they ended up you putting in electric resistance heat, a uh, very small amount, like maybe one or two heaters in the house, because they felt that the homeowners would want that security of like knowing that there's a backup system on the for on the coldest days. Um, so does it increase or decrease the the cost of construction to go to this uh, standard? If you go on down and. And look at the business model that might give us a better indication of well that. well this one here is air source heat well, pump this is this is for big systems. multifamily buildings so if you go down to where they talk about the business buildings beyond the multifamily new construction and there, there's nothing in here on single family homes no so that we don't have any uh, any way of looking at that but the second half of the chart is uh Business new office construction. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of like a whole different mm -hmm. scenario for sure. Um, let's see. It, it might be closer to what home building is than the than multi family house. Um, yeah, so the baseline. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it would be because I think these are like assumed to be really big buildings. That could be. Because, um, so you they know, they have a cooling tower. Yeah. Um, but here, clearly, the the electric systems are more costly to install. Um, And but but anyway, um, this is kind of this is one study. Uh, I also may uh, create a survey that I'm going to be um, sending out to developers so that we can hear straight from them because mm -hmm. some of them have built in South Burlington. I can I can show you if you want um, what uh, what that what I have on this. <laughs> um, you know so. Kind of go introduce it. Um, 
And, you know, Town of Wilson's considering adopting clean heat ordinance, and then this would regulate the way new homes are heated and cooled. And we're uh, developing some parameters for that, and we'd like your input. Um, and so this is, you know, the ordinance would probably be like South Burlington's, and this is some of the recommendations thus far that have been made by the Energy Committee. Um, it would apply to new buildings, not existing buildings. It would include a waiver provision. Um, if a developer can demonstrate conclusively that a non-fossil fuel heating system is more expensive over 25 years, I mean, I, I think as a housing committee, we would look for a waiver for for, for um affordable affordable housing right there. Mm -hmm. And 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 um you know, and not with this math. I mean, over 25 years, that's probably gonna be hard for anyone to pass anyone to come up with that math. So I don't I don't know what that's that seems pretty limiting. But but I think as a housing committee, we would definitely want exceptions for affordable mm -hmm. housing. And I think um I mean, the other way we can solve housing in in Williston is to get people to move out of bigger houses into downsize mm -hmm. to be able to stay in town. So whether it's smaller units that would encourage you know them to free up the bigger house for the bigger families, yeah, you know, we we wouldn't want to see a massive increase in the price there mm -hmm. either. So, um, so at any rate, uh, I asked a bunch of questions, um, you know. <clears throat> whether they've developed in Williston before or are going to or considering, and then whether they've developed in South Burlington or Burlington, did they seek a waiver? Did they get a waiver? Um, and then what impact did the requirement have on the cost of the project? What adjustments had to be implemented due to the requirement? Um, and then did this requirement prevent the inclusion of affordable homes where they otherwise have been would have been included? Mm -hmm. um, what challenges does this requirement present? What opportunities does this requirement offer? What, if any, specific concerns do you have with Wilson's proposed community ordinance? What, if any, recommendations do you have? Is there anything else you'd like to share? You'd like us to know. Mm -hmm. So, um, my plan would be to distribute that pretty widely to developers in the in the area, even those that, that have never developed in Williston, just to get a sense of what the feeling is around this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at, just to get some feedback. And I've already talked to a couple of developers who have, you know, expressed their opinions. Um, and then there, yeah, there definitely are concerns about it for sure. Um, but, but yeah, waiver for, um, affordable, uh, homes or housing or projects with affordable homes. Um, and that's something, if that's something you want to recommend. That's, you know, that's, well, does it look like that's, it's going to be more expensive to build affordable homes with, <laughs> This with multi family multi family thing. Um, there's always the compromise because when you're building affordable homes, you not only want to look at the at the price of building, but also the the cost of operating. Right. And and right. And and clearly and dropping the cost as long of as you don't get below whatever the lower temperature of your of your um, mm -hmm. uh, non. Uh, Non your secondary carbon based yeah. heat, mm -hmm. um, your operating costs are are, are lower. Even if you the, can go with this, even though the construction well, cost is high, the electric resistance it was less. Well, so to be clear, um, in a newly constructed building, well, actually, I think in any new or old. Um, if you're heating with heating with gas is going to be cheaper than heating with electricity. Really? Because it's just the price of gas is still less than than um and the electricity. Yeah. So that's something I grapple with. Um, you know, so you're so we're asking uh people and some, you know, for market rate homes, maybe it's not a big deal, but for affordable housing, you're asking folks to pay 
more for your uh, more for installation and more for for heat for operation. Yeah, I mean operation is kind of what I was yeah was thinking. I mean, there one way that you might deal with that in a in a um, development that has required uh, that's required uh, affordability provisions. Um, and we're monitoring it um, is to raise the, the utility allowance so that it matches those costs of heating with electric. So, in other words, there's sort of set, you know, sort of a standard allowances for utilities. So if you if if you raise that um, allowance, then they have to charge less for the remainder. So that's one way of keeping rents kind of low. Um, but I don't know. You say a building question, and maybe this is more Charlie question. But you talk about the cost per square foot. What is he is a furnace or whatever you're going to put in there really that linear? Like if I put an extra hundred square feet, does it really, or is it more like you either buy this smaller? You know what I'm saying? Like you got to buy a furnace or whatever you mm -hmm. call it, right? So there's probably a minimum price on a furnace. It probably doesn't like if you build a a hundred square foot place. Does it does it is is it really linear like that? No, no, it's probably you're like here and you go a little higher, yeah. right? Yeah. So since we want smaller units built, um, both because that's our demographics here and our household size in Williston, and because that's affordable, mm -hmm. um, do these numbers really play right? It's just it's such a hard compromise it's because yeah. the thing that's going to happen is if we get eighty percent of the the population using uh not using gas gas will go away right so yes, uh, so eventually it, mm -hmm. you need to plan on on that conversion yeah. where are we on that right now we're, we've just barely begun that road but yeah. that's clearly a direction that that uh that the world is going to go yeah yep I don't know that eighty percent is the right number, but somewhere there's a. a yeah. And I, I, my primary heat is oil. At some point, if there won't be oil dealers around because there won't mm -hmm. be enough people like me using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's true, and you know heat pumps are getting better, and they keep getting better, you know, every year. And you know the houses we are building are just so energy efficient that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it helps mitigate some of the cost differential because it's just we're building smaller, more energy efficient homes are going to be cheaper right. no matter what you use. You know, we did ask for a waiver um, on our Manhattan Drive in Burlington, but, you know, by getting to that time where we won't be asking for waivers where. Yeah. And, and waivers might not be available for us um, in certain areas, but. And and when you when you got that waiver, did you, I mean, my understanding is that they also require you to show that. It's, it would be more expensive over the you know twenty five year period. Yeah, I'll make a note to see if I can find out what we submitted. Yeah, I'd be interested in that answer when you get it. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I know. Well. Well. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, one of the developers I was talking to mentioned that um, the the uh, state residential energy code has, you know, just ramped up this year. And so the stretch code is like really, really stringent. And those houses are, you know, like, like you said, like they hardly take anything to heat those, those homes. So that's perhaps the most impactful and important thing you can do is build energy efficient homes and, you know, build. Mm -hmm. build yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. So at some point, you want something from us to the select board about what? At some point, and um, what's the time frame on that? At some point, um, I think. Yeah, I'd like something from you. Um, I think we're going to send this out. We're going to wait to get some responses. Um, the energy committee is going to sort of, you know, uh, finalize their what their recommendations are, and then 
you know, yes, if, if you would like to make some recommendations, that would be awesome. I, I talked to the man at your energy fair who was uh, 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 selling heat pumps. And, and he said that, that with my income level, he could put a heat pump in my house for, for $1,300. Oh, yeah. With the um, I haven't invited him over to talk to him. I don't know what brand he's using and whether it was right. too small a capacity to do what needed to be done. I, I don't know any of that. It's probably through Efficiency Vermont. They're offering um, up. I mean, it, it basically is with the, with the uh, IRA, uh, the the money for rebates. Um, it, it will be like practically a hundred percent of the cost of of heat pumps if you're income qualified. That's like below. 80%. And then for modern income homes, it'll be like 50% of the cost. So that doesn't surprise me too much. I think that's, you know, and, and right now, uh, efficiency Vermont is saying you can get up to 9,500 off of a heat pump installation. So that sounds about right. Um, yeah. So they're really, you know, the whole objective of, of those uh, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act provisions uh, related to energy and climate is to make it accessible for um, lower income households to to uh, transition to all electric. Um, when I first looked at the heat pump, I, I had a salesman from one of the companies come in and it, it was very clear that that because I don't have an air conditioner, that I, that I wouldn't save money by using a heat pump. I, I couldn't even get to a break-in point to, to cover the cost of the air conditioner, but... Thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I could. <laughs> yeah, there's some, yeah. some days where you. Yeah. There's some days where you could. Yeah, use a little cool. Yeah. I don't need the cooling. I, mm -hmm. yeah. I actually have a heat pump water heater in my basement, so that if the house got way too hot, I could go sit in the basement and read a book. But <laughs> because I took advantage of the efficiency Vermont rebates on insulation, mm -hmm. my house I, it's never been over seventy nine degrees since I had that done. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's nice. great. Mm -hmm. So I, I just would love to see the those beautiful graphs that we had on the on the business and on the uh, and on the multifamily house. I'd love to see those graphs for single family houses. Uh -huh. I don't know who's putting them together, but uh yeah. I mean, this is the only I've been looking around. This is the only source I've found that like really, you know kind of has those explains it in in a way that make you know sort of makes sense and and with those graphs and charts um you know and and yeah yeah i, I could i can keep looking around i've asked vermont gas if they'll send me information on you know the cost differences for insulation yeah. and, and stuff and i would not be at all interested in telling people with existing dwellings that they need to convert mm. but the possibility of, of requiring it on new construction i i would i'd consider that if, if i could see data that that showed it to be economically feasible yeah mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah well that's a question too so do those graphs um contain the information the the cost savings from the rebates and stuff um I Probably think not. they do. They oh. should. Um, of course, the rebates have changed since right. that was put together, and now there's well, there's, there's more. Um, yeah. But, but we can't always assume there are rebates. I mean, if this becomes the town right. rule, it'll right. be here forever. You right. know, so and the rebates may or may not be. Well, rules can always change, and yeah. just as much as rebates can. Yeah. yeah slow process but, mm -hmm. but possible yep right i don't i judge that we are not ready to take a position on supporting the the, the housing committee yet that we'd like to have a little the, more the, information uh, am i correct in that yeah and i i i wasn't anticipating or expecting that you know you're gonna write a position tonight on it i just wanted okay. to give you a little bit more information um yeah it's interesting though okay Mm -hmm. Enjoy learning that stuff. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. Then the next topic is uh, the uh, ADU workshop and recap. Uh, yeah. 
So who was there? Marla, you were there. You were there. I was there. I was there. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> I was in England. Yeah. <laughs> England. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> it was like the one night that month I had something, so I oh, yeah. couldn't go. I told Pam, like, Sorry. So, I wanted to be there. Uh, uh, over 60 people showed up. And, and I was, talked to at least three families from yeah. Austin that were there for because they were interested in the possibility. Right. Yeah. Um, standing room only at the Shelburne Town Hall <laughs> with literally. It was, yeah, it was great. I was. Surprised that there was that much interest. Yeah, big on there. It seems like the town meetings often have food. Yeah, yeah. The pizza, <laughs> right? was, was, tea, was the pizza factor like, like was that? Were, yeah, <laughs> like a you didn't have enough pizza, pizza for everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's <laughs> what got people to our Wilson twenty fifty events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, good food work there too. Um, but I, I thought it was. Uh, I mean, how did? What did you think, Charlie? Of the of the. I don't know the structure and the content of the. Well, I thought it went went very well. I I uh, their their planning commissioner who was there talking didn't seem to realize that we had two towns, so it was important oh. that you stepped in from time to time to, <laughs> to point out the differences. But no, I thought that that having the panel and and dealing with with questions was a good way to to handle that whole thing. What did you think? Yeah. Well, it was good to have him there because people had very well, he needed the answers questions. that he had. Then, yeah, right. And um, right. And there are you know some a few differences between Wilston and Shelburne for sure. But um, I think there is a lot of interest. Um, so you know, if you wanted to do a workshop at some point um, here, I think that so I'm left with a question, and I knew that I was going to come and ask you the question tonight. All of the discussion was about uh, auxiliary dwelling units and duplexes. And, and if I want an auxiliary dwelling unit, I'm limited to uh, uh, either 900 square feet or half the area of the primary dwelling unit, whichever is greater. And yeah. the owner has to occupy one of the units. Yeah, right. But the same regulation that we talked about, talked about building a duplex. Why would I choose an auxiliary dwelling unit over a duplex? Um, it to be... Um, there had to be some kind of space between the ADU and the house. Well, you can oh. build an ADU that's connected to your house. Right. But it, as long as it has a separate entrance and, yeah, and a kitchen and a bathroom. Yeah. I think, I mean, the if you wanted to build a separate structure on your property, then it would be, it wouldn't be a duplex. It would be oh. an ADU. The but, separate structure has to be can't be a duplex. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that sounds right. Right. Um, so in that case, yeah, it'd be it'd be an ADU unless you wanted to subdivide your property and you know build another home there. Yeah. Or, but but if you're, it's going to be attached, you could do either one. You could do either one. And if you did it as a duplex, you wouldn't have those two restrictions. Right. Yep. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Right. Um, it I'm sounds like to... for attached, <laughs> the duplex is the way to go, whatever you're doing. It seems like it's less restrictive. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway. Um, but if we did have a workshop, it, this idea of subdividing might be of interest mm -hmm. too. Yeah. You know, I think we do. Some of the town was set out before we had water and sewer, so those are bigger lots. I think it's the same kind of lots you were showing us here. So there are subdividable lots in town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody suggested that about my situation because I have an acre. Uh -huh. I forget why it didn't make sense to me at the time, but anyway. But yeah, mm -hmm. somebody that my niece talked to at the state, I think, said that was an option. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So my, I mean, maybe those are two different workshops. Yeah. Because if you're subdividing a lot, that's a different process. Yeah, um, it is. I mean, it could be, it could be one workshop where you're just sort of like, where you're, you're, you're talking about the the various ways that you can develop a small property. So you could, you could do an ADU, you could do a duplex, you could um, subdivide your property and 
build another home or you know subdivide and sell to somebody who wants to build another home. Are there height restrictions in the residential area? 36 feet. Well, a meeting like that might be cool, like introductory comments and then breakout yeah. or like three breakout groups or whatever mm -hmm. people could go yeah. and ask. Yeah, right. So I think that'd be something worth mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought the workshop was really good and I thought that we should consider having one. How was their builder? They were going to have a builder okay. there. How was the builder? He didn't show up. No, the builder showed up. It Who's was the far someone, left guy. Someone from the state um, oh, was supposed okay. to come, and they didn't show up. Someone from ACCD. So, was did the builder get many questions? He got some yeah. questions. Yeah. 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 Do we know an ADU builder? Or? There, there was actually a. Uh, maybe I can. I don't know if I can find their email, but. Um, the folks that were building these tiny houses, basically. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I can't I remember the name. The... Pam would know if we if we emailed her and asked. Yeah. But they email they reached out sort of a few days before the workshop and said, "Hey, we'd really love to come and share our our new building company." Um, and they build these like modular little modular tiny houses, kind of and. Mm -hmm. They have these different models, and they either have a package where they come and they build it, they put it together, or they have like a kit that they send you and you have your contractor build it or you build it yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's different prices, but um, the prices were, I mean, it was a lot lower than your typical new builds construction, for sure. And it, and it sounded really interesting. Um, Partly because they had standard, you know, they had it's standardized it so right that it could you know, two or three versions of the same mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah so they could give you kind of the whole design and then they had already priced out right so if we have one of these we want matt and you do we want a builder yeah that'd be good and, probably and what else the did they have someone from the state probably they had two people who had already built ADUs. Right, right. So if we can get somebody, a couple of people who have gone through that process successfully, yeah, that would be It'd be better if they built one and rent it out too. I mean, I know there's a lot of ADUs that are empty. So, you know, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. Well, it might be interesting too to hear from um, like a real estate agent or something like that. What what does that do to your resale value for your for your home? Or mm -hmm. if you if you subdivide it, have, have, that was one of the concerns I had. Was like, who's going to buy? <laughs> is the same person going to buy both lots, or or is it going to get sold to, to you know two different people? And are they want going to want to be in such close proximity to each other? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So I think that is a concern for people as well. Yeah, rental income. Mm -hmm. So, do we want to do anything with that now? Is this a, a a meeting where we're going to to try to set a date and get people, or are we just going to talk about it and put it on the agenda for later? I, that's what, I'm, that's I'm what kind I of noting we're doing. going into the holiday season. Yeah. For you know, for me, I look yeah. at the calendar. I'm like, okay, October. Oh, then, then if well, we, the other thing is, I I would suggest if if we did a workshop here that we get that ADU guide done. So mm -hmm. that we can part of that workshop can be right. showing people the guide and how to use it. That'd be mm -hmm. my suggestion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that you know that yeah. having it available at the very least. Yeah. 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 So I guess we should talk about it. I mean, we if we're doing it in January, we can talk about yeah. it monthly for January, February, March, something yeah. like that. And the difference between an ADU and a mother-in-law apartment is uh, the uh, external entry. Well, I'm, it has to have bathroom, kitchen, and external entry. And I didn't know that until yeah. I went to that session. A high maintenance mother in law. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you use it for whoever's in it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah, like it, yeah. Anything else on the ADU workshop? So mm -hmm. this Saturday we have the, the film just getting by. Sunday. The, Sunday. Sunday. I won't be there. Sunday. Yeah, I will come. I'm leaving town for that.
Make you end there. Okay. Yeah, I'm being there either. Where, where is it? Yeah, I'm trying to tell. Sunday, five o'clock, is it? Nope. Sunday at uh, seven, doors open at 6 30. So starts promptly at seven. Um, we've sold 80 tickets. Eight? 80. Wow, 80. Nice. Out of 100. Okay. Oh, they're only a hundred. That's okay. So you need to buy tickets, and it's up in Essex Street. Oh, yeah. Essex. <laughs> majestic. Majestic. So majestic. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. That yeah, that was a lame comment. So do people have have physical tickets to get in or on their phone or something. Uh, well, they're. We're not going to ask for physical tickets, but I'll have a list of names, and then when people come in, I'll just ask for people's names, and I'll check them off, and it. There, you know, I expect there will be some walk-ins. I also expect there will be some no-shows um, for people that signed up. Do you need help checking names off? Well, I was going to ask, um, so let's see. I was going to ask if anybody wants to come and kind of help out in any way or even be part of the Q&A or something um, at the end. Uh, well, I, I can be there. I can check off names. I'm not sure yeah. what Q and A I would oh. be strong at, but yeah. Um, well, sure. That'd be that'd mm -hmm. be great. Um, yeah, let me get back to you tomorrow. Well, okay. I'm gonna try to be there. I'm gonna double check my schedule. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Um, but yeah, I should be good. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and then, do you want? Like, so we're gonna have a table with some materials um, from. Like, let's see, Community Justice Center and uh, Food Shelf. And do you want anything at that? Do you want that? Should I bring copies of the housing needs assessment for Williston? That would be or? great. Um, would I be able to bring some stuff from Habitat to throw? Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think that needs assessment report is cool. I mean, it's, it's, someone's managed to not see it this far. I think mm -hmm. for the fans. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Um, Any update on Amy? Yeah, she's scheduled to come in November. Um, that's what I wanted to bring up. Can folks meet on November 20th? It's actually better for me. What? 20th. That's the third Wednesday, not the first. That's better than me. I think. Yeah, I, yeah, the week before that, I can't, but I can that week. Sure. And yeah, great. Okay. So switch from the sixth to the twelfth. Yeah. Okay. And maybe should I send out a calendar note on that? Or I have sent myself a note, so I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so she's coming, and um, oh, um, I wanted to ask Marla if you ever heard anything back from Charlie. No, but I'm I figured I'd write him again, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and, and we'll keep uh, I think on the uh, your work plan, it has a goal of four guest speakers, um between now and end of June. So, you know, we could probably do that, mm -hmm. I think. And, and if anybody has anybody in mind, so Amy and then, and then someone from Summit, and maybe, if we, yeah. Um, I actually, I was thinking of possibly inviting, well, inviting Chris Snyder either to uh, energy committee meeting or housing committee meeting and inviting both committees because he he you know is one that has done a building he's built in South Burlington under their under their clean heat ordinance and so he knows kind of the the ins and outs and has a lot to say I imagine so that would be useful yeah we should hear it mm -hmm. all right Okay, is there any uh, other business that we need to attend to tonight? I don't think so. And then uh, let us adjourn before 8 o'clock. All right, sounds good.